start with your team, Chris. I'm not sure how much you're willing to share a couple of hours before you announce it, but Reece Stanley subbed early last week. Has he come with you and is he likely to play this for tomorrow night? No, Reese won't play. We're going to manage a few out as we have done for most of the year. So Tom Hawkins was earmarked post-game last week. Mitch Duncan hasn't made the trip and neither has Reese Stanley. So um, we'll have a few changes. Um, but it's exciting too. We've got a couple of um, guys who will come back in um, fresh and some guys that we have um, earmarked for quite a while that we think are suited to, to these conditions. Is Toby Conway one of those? You're Flexer Nickel, is he okay and is he likely to play? Yeah, he, he'll almost certainly play. So um, we were hopeful that he was actually um, planned to play last week but just had this little hip flexor issue that was probably touch and go but um, we don't take any any risks with any of our players. But, but Toby's right, um, you know, up at the top of the priority list when it comes to just being a little bit careful. So if anything, it's left him in, we think, um, really good shape to play well tomorrow night. It's obviously a lot of experience that you've rested um, and quality from your team this week. How do you how do you weigh that up, trying to chase the short term success of a win versus your your overall picture of a long season and trying to manage these guys to the finish line? Yeah, it's complicated. You can't I don't think satisfy every requirement every single week. Um, but as a guide, we try not to get too beholden to uh, the opposition we're playing. Um, we do think a little bit about, you know, the length of break and um, the venue and those sort of things. But but the overwhelming um, priority is is to look at it at an individual level. And um, so Tom Hawkins and, and Mitch Duncan um, and Reece Stanley, um, I'm, I'm loath to say at their age because you know the, the age is not um, necessarily the, des the deciding factor. It's more just how we think about their season overall. So. Um, we've worked pretty hard with our list management to, to build what we think is a deep list um, and, and ideally we're getting to the point where um, while we'd like to have some guys in the team, their replacements um, you know, offer something really valuable as well. We think that's the case this week. Um, did you consider bringing Tom Hawkins given Jeremy Cameron was ruled out? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we, we did. And, and Jeremy was ruled out pretty quickly after the game, so we had time to think about it. But in the end, our sort of medium-term planning, I guess, sort of overrode that, um, you know, potential need to get Tom into the team. And again, Shannon Neal, someone we've been trying to get into the team for quite a while. He, he came in against uh, North Melbourne, I think it was round five, and, and played really well, you know, well enough to um, hold his spot. But Hawkins came back in the next week, so... Um, we, we think we've got a, um, a, a good in there and, and it gives us a chance just to give a little bit of a different look you know, in, the, in the conditions which um, you know, we, we, we rarely play um, in this heat but we do play in slippery conditions so, so that was something that factored into our thinking. And how big an opportunity is this for Shannon Neal having to fill the void of Hawkins and Cameron? Yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity but we're really wary that we don't build it up to be a situation where he's got four quarters of AFL footy to prove himself. That's not the way we're thinking about it. He shouldn't go in, and, and I'm confident he won't go in, um, thinking that this is his one chance and if he doesn't nail it, that he won't get another. We, we, will, we will find ways to get him into the team almost irrespective um, of, of how things are going. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that um, you know, it won't be as difficult as that. He'll, he'll just play well enough over time to find a way into our team. He's, he's a really talented young man. Some people are saying that the, the AFL should have forced Jeremy Cameron from the field after he caught that head knock um, in your last game. I mean, do you, does there need to be more clarity around what happens here when a player um, suffers a head injury like that? Uh, well, I mean, the way the rules are at the moment, I'm um, actually I'm re I'm very removed from it. So, um, I mean, if if you force me to think about it a bit more, I could give you an opinion. But because it is. Um, something that's really quarantined from the, the head coach's decision making. Um, I, I've um, taken what I think is the logical approach to, to not delve into it too much, like ir irrespective of sort of what I thought. Um, even if I did give a bit more thought to it, I wouldn't get a say in it anyway. So, uh, and I think that's appropriate. So um, it's, it's an interesting conversation, but just one that I can't really contribute to. Is there any need for the club to review the process of Friday night or are we all happy from your end? 
Well, from my end, I'm just none the wiser. I'm just completely oblivious to it. Um, now, I, I could go and ask questions, but I just don't think that's um, appropriate or helpful. Do you know if the AFL sought clarity from the club at all? No. And how is Jeremy? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, um, and again, I think sometimes coaches at press conference just kind of get drawn into giving an opinion that they really don't have um, any knowledge on. Like I could give you a really glib kind of response that would be making a whole range of assumptions, but um, I, I'm just so removed from that process that I couldn't comment intelligently. Um, how, big, how big of an opportunity is this Thursday night's game for some emerging players, given the amount of experience that's out? Yeah, it's a, it's a positive way of looking at it, we think. But again, it's a bit similar to the Shannon Neal one. We're, we're not saying to those guys that we'll get their opportunity that kind of, this is it, boys. You've got you to take your chance now or it won't be there next time. We, we think that, you know, uh, to a man, the guys that are, that are going to come um, into our team, you know, have done it at AFL level um, already this year. Just sort of thinking through it quickly in my head, there's not one guy that hasn't played really high level AFL footy um, this year, so we're confident. And again, we didn't we didn't set up this week um, to manage our older players. We set up this week to give us the best chance to win. Um, obviously, there are other considerations there, but we're really confident we picked a team and have a plan that's going to challenge the Gold Coast. And what was the re the reasoning behind resting Mitch Duncan? Uh, just that he's going to come out at some stage. He hasn't um, missed any footy this year. He's someone that um, you know. It, it, I'm going to say, I'm going to just, this is a guess, but I reckon it's about 80% of our list that for one reason or another won't play every week. Um, Mitch is kind of at the more experienced end of the spectrum. So someone like Jai Clark, who we've managed a bit as well in his second year, is at the other end, but they'll all come out. So this is just where it landed for Mitch. Brandon Parfit, local boy, will be running out tomorrow night. How hard has he had to work to really establish his squad in your team? Yeah, he's had to work really hard. I mean, he's been, we brought him in. He was an early second round pick off the top of my head. And we, we were really confident um, in his first year or so. Um, I think he came into our team pretty early in his first year that he was going to be a really good player for us. And he had a series of unlucky injuries. I'm going to say it was almost in his fourth or fifth game. He had a bad hamstring strain. He's had a broken thumb in our sort of premiership year, which held him out for a long time in the lead up to finals and was good enough to work his way into our team. Um, grand final day, but it sort of had some challenges along the way and um, his last pre-season was clearly his best, uh, uninterrupted and you know he, he's in as good a physical shape as he's ever been in, so he's giving himself a chance um, to let that talent flow through and I think it's a bit underrated these days how um, you know even really talented players can be limited by either their preparation or little niggly injuries and I think more than anything what we're seeing from, from Brandon is just an opportunity for him to play at his best without these limitations. Chris, and sorry, um, you yeah, met the umpire's boss earlier in the week, um, did you get clarity on the issues you um, queried I guess pre previously, the holding the ball and the advantage rule? No, I didn't, um, no it wasn't that sort of meeting, so Stephen McBurney is the new um, head of umpiring. He's 11 days into his job and he's in the process of getting around to see all the clubs. So it wasn't, wasn't that sort of meeting. And, um, and even sort of the, the contribution that I'm trying to make to the conversation is just that. It's a, it, there, there are a series of questions um, that kind of raise um, the consideration that everyone needs to make when you think about these things. It's not a matter of saying this is right or this is wrong. It's, for example, the holding the ball one, like the, the question now. Things, things continually evolve. So the question's been, and it's really clear to everyone that you can't dump a player in a tackle, at least without taking you know, great risk. You've got to be really, really careful that you don't um, dump a player in a tackle and have his head hit the ground. And so that adds a new kind of wrinkle to the holding the ball sort of situation when um, players who previously would have taken that guy to ground now have to be a little bit more careful. And I don't think the rule makers really considered that, you know, five or, 10 years ago, maybe even maybe even 12 months ago. Um, and so um, Laura Kane and, and the AFL in particular have um, gone to great lengths and we really support this, um, that they want to communicate more and they're really happy for people to contribute to the conversation as long as it's respectful. I'm really comfortable and confident that that was and will be the case. So it felt, from your perspective, that the tone from Stephen McBurney in the AFL was, was positive, like receptive to your um, contribution? 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that's Again, it's not... Um, I don't think anyone should think that behind the scenes there's this kind of adversarial relationship. It's, it's really the opposite. It's like, what are you seeing from your end? These are the challenges that we see coaching. Because at the end of the day, that is our responsibility above and beyond everything else. It's to understand the rules as well as you possibly can so you can coach the players appropriately. So I think it's in our interest to be really open about the way we think about those things. And in return, they're really clear on the challenges they face as well. And, as I said, post-game, it's an incredibly difficult game to umpire and your expectation should be that you're not going to get perfection. And, and we don't want to go to a, a system, in my view, where we go to the video for every single um, issue and, and stop the game. That's not the nature of our game. So if you want to continue the positive nature of the game, you've got to accept that sometimes the umpire is going to be blindsided or sometimes they're going to be less than perfect decisions, but on balance, that's going to be a good thing. We're kicking off um, the Doug Nichols round tomorrow night, but there's been a bit of discussion in the last week or so about the fact that there are fewer Indigenous players on lists than there have been in the past. So, uh, is there something we can do better here to make sure there are more Aboriginal people playing the game at the highest level? And do you have any thoughts as to why those numbers have dropped off? Yeah, I mean, there's one really tangible reason. There was an NGA um, academy system brought in um, a little while ago that made it easier for Indigenous players to end up on play on clubs lists without them having to give up draft picks um, and a lot of those players have since gone off the list it's that's sort of the way it works if it's easier to get on the list without giving up um, draft assets it's, it, it also tends to be a case of sometimes last one in first one out so I don't think that's reflective of um, a longer pattern um, and, and while the overall raw numbers may have come down, um, the Indigenous um, players in the AFL are way overrepresented compared to the population. So it's still an overwhelmingly positive part of our game. Um, so that said, um, any ideas to make it easier for talented Indigenous players to find a way into the AFL um, and remove any obstacles that may be there um, are worth exploring. But again, I. I can sort of say what outcome you'd like, but I'm far from an expert on, on how you'd improve it. And obviously coming off a couple of losses, how are the boys feeling about Thursday night? Are they feeling prepared? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because we, we try to build an environment where the, um, at least the footy department during the week should feel similar whether you're 7-0 and or whether you're 0-7 and um, and it's I guess it's been a bit of a strange period for us because we started the year so well um, and then a couple of losses in a row um, kind of halt your momentum a little bit but I mean I would like to think that it's it's felt pretty similar um, but, but but even before the last couple of weeks we, we we knew that we had a lot to improve on and and we've always um, irrespective of how we've gone in the first couple of months have been believers that it takes almost, you know, a full cycle where everyone's played each other to get a feel. And, and, and even then, like the, the draw's really strange. We play Carlton twice in seven weeks um, and we don't play West Coast until round 24. Um, so even that idea that you've got to wait until everyone's played each other doesn't really flow through. So I think the lesson is don't look too much at the ladder. Um, you know, don't get too happy with yourself if the win-loss is good. And if you have a few... Um, Poor games so over the course of the season. I think every every team's going to have that. So try to keep it even, and I think we've done that. And again, we've looked to attack this week from a long way out. We, we knew that we were playing up here against the Gold Coast in October, um, and we've thought about it consistently since then. Is um, Tom Stewart the best mature age recruit we've seen in the AFL in the last 50 years? Yeah, easily. But I'm so biased. You shouldn't even listen to what I say. I, I mean, I don't even know who the other candidates are. But I mean, I. You know, if he's not the best player in the game, he's in the top handful, in, in my opinion. Again, uh, a horrendously biased um, and Geelong point of view, that one. Um, but I think one, the AFL had James Pods, he had at number two. So oh, did they? OK, well, he's much, much better than Pods. No doubt about that. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, but, yeah, if, if Pods is two, then that's good. The Cats... I mean, again, we, we sort of... We do joke about it a little bit. We, we, we are an older list and... Um, that's been a little bit um, out of necessity and a little bit by design. Um, but the other th part that we're proud of without sort of you know, patting ourselves on the back too much is that Tom's a local boy and you know, we've, we've always biased our list management towards the local guys and for someone to come out of pretty much you know, South Barwon as a 20, 21 year old and be one of the best players in the game is a great story. 
And obviously being the Sir Doug Nichols round, do you hope that um, having rounds like this might encourage more young Indigenous footballers to come and play AFL? I hope so. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to... Um, I wouldn't like to suggest that because we have rounds like these that it solves all the problems, but by making it a little bit more visible, I mean, maybe, maybe there is a case to be made that, um, you know, a young Indigenous boy watching the Cats play St Doug Nichols round and seeing a little bit of, um, or a bit more of Brandon Parfitt's story or, um, you know, the other Indigenous players around the competition might inspire them to think that, well, if it's possible for them, it's possible for me. So, you know, if, if, that, if that's just something little that happens from it, then I think it, um, is something well worth doing. Brandon's younger brother, right. Calvin Ferris Chong, has been carving it up in the local competition. You see someone who's on your radar? Well, um, I'll get Andrew Mackey, who's just um, out of shot, to come in and talk about that, because that's more um, his remit than, than mine. But um, Stephen Wells will be up here as well, watching them as well. Like, we've, I mean, probably two, like, even playing the Gold Coast, like, they've got some, you know, they, they have... Um, you know, an interest in this reason, in this region, um, and, and done, I think they've done a great job of, you know, promoting the Indigenous boys, um, and even kind of um, Damien Hardwick at Richmond, sort of before that, they play a style of game that seems to suit a few of those boys. Um, yeah, it's um, in a way you'd like to spend a bit more time up here and, and, and see it for yourself, but uh, just a little outside of of what it is that I do as a head coach.